Welcome to Accidental Conflict, a new take on U.S.-China tensions. Our special guest speaker is economist Stephen Roach, who we have been eagerly anticipating joining us for a very long time and who will be formally introduced in just a moment. Welcome to our global trustees, our Northern California Honorary Chairs, Jack Wadsworth and Ken Wilcox, our Chair Gary Reichel, our Advisory Board members, Groundbreaker and Innovator members, and global members from our 14 centers around the world. I'm Margaret Conley, Executive Director of our Northern California Center. Our format for today, I'll introduce our moderator, Susan Lee. She'll introduce Dr. Roach. He'll give keynote remarks, and then the two of them will have a moderated discussion. Then they'll take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, type it in the Q&A box for everyone to see. Susan's going to monitor what's coming in and get to as many questions as possible. This event is on the record, and we are recording. We have an hour for this program. We'll end at 6 p.m. Pacific. That's 9 p.m. Eastern. Full speaker bios are on our website and also in our chat box. Following this event, we're going to host a short VIP reception where we will continue the discussion with our speakers. If you'd like to join our VIP receptions in the future, reach out to our team and we will help you do that. Now, I am very excited to introduce our moderator, Susan Lee. Susan covers breaking financial news as a business correspondent at Fox Business News out of their headquarters in New York. She has interviewed some of the top names in business and economic policy, including Tim Cook, Prime Minister Trudeau, and Meg Whitman. She was previously co-anchor of CNBC's Asia Squawk Box and Worldwide Exchange. Before that, she was anchoring Bloomberg Television out of Hong Kong. Susan, we've spent many very early mornings in Asia together <laughs> on the air. Yes. It's so great to have you here at Asia Society. Thank you so much for doing this. No, Margaret, this is such a treat for me because really it's just a nostalgia going back uh, back to our days in Asia. And I have to say, Mark Conley was always a fantastic reporter and correspondent. So it's really a pleasure to be part of this. Now, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, who is a pleasure as well. He's one of my favorite guests in the Asia Pacific. He was always keen to do anything I put him on set to do, whether it was yoga for my morning shows or one of the most, I think one of the most famous and infamous incidents and a headliner, by the way, because he's not afraid to share his opinions, which makes him ultra special, is that he told, what did he say? He said he wanted to take a back to Paul Krugman and this was, I think it had to do with monetary policy, but he was also, of course, sought out because of his influential opinions on the global economy. He was the first economist in the early 2000s to go bullish on China. He spent 30 years as a chief economist at Morgan Stanley and then spent numerous years as chairman in the Asia Pacific. And now he has a new book. And I think it's really interesting timing that now I think he's going full reversal on his views on China. And I'll let him share that with you in just a bit. And his new book is coming out in October. It's called Accidental Conflict. See, I'm showing this for you. A new take on U.S.-China tensions. One of my favorite guests. And if we can just bring Dr. Stephen Roach onto the program here. Stephen, how have you been? Well, now that I get to share the stage with you, Susan, I'm, I'm fine. It's a pleasure to see you again. And uh, thank you also, uh, Margaret, for your um, kind remarks and um, special hello to all my uh, friends and former colleagues who have uh, plugged into this program, especially my old buddy, uh, Jack Wadsworth. Um, but in any case, um, uh, I want to spend a, about 15 minutes just giving you a sense of um, what I think is a, a, a different perspective on the U.S.-China uh, conflict. Uh, we're all focused right now on Russia uh, and uh, the potential clash between Russia and the NATO alliance, especially uh, the U.S. We've, we've been inundated uh, with um, concerns about that from um, your network, Susan, and virtually every other <laughs> feed that I that I um, am aware of, but um, I'm here to tell you that that's really a warm up for what is likely to be the major geostrategic event of this century, and that is this um, uh, growing and worrisome uh, conflict between the United States uh, and uh, China, and the. The thesis of this new book that I'm eager to get out 
is that this is a conflict that did not have to happen were it not for um, politically expedient false narratives embraced by both sides with respect to their distorted uh, impressions uh, of each other. Uh, and, um, you know, that's the, the justification for the title accidental conflict, uh, the conflict that truly did not have to happen if we had better, more responsible behavior on both sides of this relationship. Um, the framework that I use to, to make this case is a, a framework that relies on uh, a stylized characterization of the relationship between the U.S. and China, a relationship that started out innocently uh, in the early 1980s, uh, two vulnerable economies, China after the Cultural Revolution, uh, the U.S. mired in a wrenching stagflation, uh, came together uh, with economic solutions for each other. Uh, it was truly a, a, a sort of a, a flirtatious marriage of convenience, if you want to call it that where China was um, desperately in need of a market for its uh, uh, production machine. And the, the U.S. and its voracious consumers were desperately in need of cheaper goods to make ends meet for income-constrained uh, uh, families and, and households. And it worked like a charm for, for um, uh, a long time. And increasingly, both <clears throat> nations, both economies, uh, became more and more dependent on each other as the sustenance for economic growth, and in the case of China, growing prosperity. But, um, you know, as these things go, um, codependency is, is the case in human relationships, not that I'm a psychologist, but I've, I've studied this uh, aspect of uh, behavioral psychology uh, to uh, research this book, um, the marriage of convenience turned into a what, what you can call a, a codependency, where they became overly dependent on one another. Uh, and we know from, uh, again, um, human uh, behavioral that uh, this pathology is uh, ultimately very precarious. Uh, you become so dependent on your partner, you lose a sense of, of who you are, uh, and you become hyper-reactive when your partner says things or does things uh, that make you uncomfortable. And so the U.S. and China, uh, around the, the mid um, uh, sort of 2007 uh, uh, period, uh, the relationship was hit with what you could call an asymmetrical shock. Uh, China decided to change its economic model and move away from uh, being a producer to focusing more uh, on developing its service sector and becoming uh, a consumer, focusing more on um, uh, indigenous innovation as opposed to importing um, the technology from uh, abroad. Uh, and um, the U.S. was uncomfortable with that. Uh, and uh, when you're uncomfortable and you're in a codependent relationship, uh, that triggers um, a lot of reactions that bounce back and forth uh, that if not handled uh, correctly or maturely can lead uh, to um, uh, deep fears. Uh, and in, in the case of the U.S.-China relationship, both nations have become consumed by uh, existential threats that they feel one poses to the other. Uh, China is convinced that the U.S. wants to contain uh, its development and prosperity. Uh, and um, 
you know, the so-called Asian pivot of the Obama administration uh, was an early sign of that from China's point of view, as was the uh, U.S. sponsored uh, TPP, which, of course, excluded uh, China. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not here to, uh, to to take a partisan stance. Uh, you know, the Biden administration has also ganged up on China with this. Um, again, this is from China's point of view, the so-called AUKUS uh, security pact, um, Australia, uh, the UK and the US uh, aimed at equipping um uh, Australia with uh, state-of-the-art submarines to counter China's formidable uh, military uh, naval uh, strength. And, you know, the U.S. has its own fears that China poses an existential threat. And this is primarily in the technology space where China's announced very clearly uh, uh, very ambitious plans to dominate the advanced industries that America believes that it's, it's entitled to, that America believes that it is uh, 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 going to be the essence of our future prosperity. How dare uh, another nation, especially China, uh, claim the turf that we cherish and believe uh, is, um, uh, is our own. So you've got both nations in this uh, uh, in- increasingly prickly uh, codependent uh, relationship, fearing deeply that one poses an existential threat uh, to the other. Uh, and that's all it takes. Uh, and it's led to um, an increasingly vicious cycle of, um, of uh, denial at first, then blame, then scorn, and then accusations uh, of these false narratives. And, um, you know, just getting back to the book, I'm not trying to sell the book because the book isn't out yet. But, you know, I, I want you all to sign up for it when it when it comes out. Um, the bulk of the book goes through um, a series of false narratives uh, that the U.S. has with respect to China and that China has with respect uh, to the U.S., and I won't go into all, all of them. I'll just mention uh, a few. Uh, on the U.S. side, um, uh, one of our classic false narratives is that we blame China uh, for our trade deficit. Uh, we have a huge trade deficit. Uh, it's getting larger. China's been the biggest piece, even though the Chinese piece has shrunk because of uh, Trump's um, uh, tariffs. Uh, but... Um, you know, we have this view that, you know, we can make things better for American workers uh, if we squeeze the Chinese piece of our massive uh, uh, trade deficit. Well, you know, with all due respect, and I promise to watch my language, uh, you know, before this speech, that's bullshit. Um, when you have a multilateral trade uh, deficit, and I just ran the numbers um, the other day for my class. Uh, we had 106 trade de- de- deficits with 106 countries um, uh, last year, uh, and that's a reflection of our shortfall of domestic saving. And so, if you go after one of the 106 and don't fix the savings problem, and of course we're not doing that, given our massive budget deficits, uh, it's like whack-a-mole, the Chinese piece uh, of our multilateral trade deficit uh, goes to other nations, and that those are usually higher cost producers, uh, and that taxes the American public. That's just an example of a false narrative. There are a number of others. Um, I think, uh, I'll just mention it without going through it, I have a chapter on uh, Huawei, uh, as a Trojan horse, uh, uh, trying to convey the impression that we're so fixated on Huawei, we're losing sight of our own uh, um, weaknesses uh, as a global um, uh, innovator. On the Chinese side, there's so many false narratives, I've, I've lost count of them. Uh, and in part, because uh, you know China has this 
extensive, massive uh, censorship regime uh, where they distort and alter virtually every um, uh, idea and argument directed uh, at uh, nations and companies and people uh, they don't like. So you don't have to go too far to find uh, countless false narratives uh, that um, uh, are evident in the Chinese discourse uh, and their um, documented um, uh, to, to uh, you know, a significant extent uh, in this new book. It doesn't just take uh, the false narratives, though, to create uh, the conflict. We have this unique technology that circulates um, narratives through social media at a speed that we've never, ever uh, seen before. So this viral amplification of false narratives, especially in a highly politically charged, politically polarized climate, uh, makes the problem uh, even worse uh, and leads to this um, escalating cycle of uh, retaliation, uh, which uh, drives the conflict uh, to uh, ex- extreme. So the concept of accidental conflict reflects this uh, profusion of dueling false narratives uh, coming out of both countries, directed at one another, amplified through social networks, and it's had actionable consequences in in the last few years uh, that they're painfully evident. The trade war, which quickly morphed into a tech war, and now we are seeing, in my opinion, the early stages of a second Cold War. And I am very worried about the second Cold War um, because, um, you know, we, we did such a terrific job uh, in winning the first Cold War against the former Soviet Union, one of the false narratives on the U.S. side is, I think we're too smug about that experience. And uh, we are um, uh, sort of making the mistake in believing that what worked in the first Cold War will work just as effectively uh, against China. And you know, my conclusion, at least on this narrative, uh, is that that view is wrong. Um, the first Cold War was a, a strong U.S. economy uh, against a faltering Soviet economy, uh, and we triumphed because of the economic disparities. Uh, the second Cold War, uh, by many measures that I document in the book, our economy is much, much weaker uh, today than it was in the first Cold War from 1947 to 1991, uh, and we're not facing a faltering uh, Soviet Union, but we're facing a rising uh, China. And then secondly, I wrote a little piece about this uh, last week. Uh, One of the most effective geostrategic strategies that worked to our advantage in the first Cold War is that, um, you know, we got together with uh, China to triangulate uh, against the former Soviet Union. It was 50 years ago next week that the the beginning of that triangulation was first evident when President Nixon uh, went uh, to um, uh, China. Last week in Beijing, on February 4th, uh, you had the um, uh, unfortunate visual of um, Vladimir Putin uh, standing next to Xi Jinping announcing their own triangulation strategy uh, with uh, an agreement uh, that is, I think, very worrisome from a Cold War perspective. We led triangulation uh, against our Cold War adversary in the first Cold War. And in this second Cold War, we are the ones who are being triangulated. So, um, you know, I think this is a worrisome state of affairs uh, in this uh, relationship. I will conclude um, with um, just a a brief uh, note on sort of the the final piece of the book. I learned a long time ago, uh, especially uh, on Wall Street, that uh, you don't really get anywhere in life if all you do is pose problems 
uh, you, you always want to at least offer uh, an answer, uh, a way out, uh, a market conclusion, uh, or um, you know, something that goes beyond the statement of the problem. So I do conclude with a, um, uh, a recipe for addressing uh, this um, accidental conflict. Uh, and briefly, it's a recipe that requires a completely different approach than the one that we are using. The current approach, um, um, I don't want to blame uh, Trump for this, but he certainly uh, took it to an extreme, was this bilateral fixation on addressing our trade deficit by going after uh, one country. We did that with Japan uh, in the 80s. Uh, and we're doing it again with China, and it, it failed back then, and it's failing miserably right now. So we need a new approach. There are three pieces to the new approach. One is to rebuild trust on areas of mutual interest, and there are plenty of them. I just give you three, climate change, global health, and cybersecurity. Secondly, uh, don't worry about bilateral trade uh, worry about the macro conditions that give you multilateral trade deficits. And that means getting uh, our saving uh, position uh, under control. And if you're concerned about these structural frictions between the United States and China, use a new framework to address them. My favorite to do that is a bilateral investment treaty. We were very close uh, after a decade of negotiation to reaching conclusion on a bilateral investment treaty. But then something happened in November uh, 2016, uh, which wiped the slate clean of virtually all the progress we had made uh, on uh, most of our trade deals. I forget uh, who was elected uh, back then. And the final piece is, um, and I've actually discussed this with one of the um, participants in this call who I will uh, not named because I don't want to uh, uh, embarrass him or associate him with this, what some might call a crackpot suggestion. But I think we need a, uh, a new permanent um, sort of a piece of uh, uh, bilateral architecture that houses a full-time secretariat uh, uh, between the United States and China that focuses on this relationship Full time, not part time, not during these, you know, grand uh, strategic and economic dialogues that used to happen, you know, once a year, sometimes twice a year. But I want 24 seven attention on all aspects of the relationship uh, staffed by professionals from both sides in a neutral jurisdiction um, uh, and in the building, um, uh, I think, to probably be funded by my good friend, Jack Wadsworth. Um, but <laughs> none of this is easy, but it's, it's a high time that we recognize that we are on a dangerous path. We are too fixated on Russia, uh, and we need to really turn our attention uh, to the main event before it's too late. This is an accidental uh, conflict that didn't have to happen. Uh, and yet, um, you know, the, the politics of nationalism uh, in China and fear uh, in America have pushed us to a dangerous spot. I will stop on that point, Susan. Wow. So you just said that we are on the brink of a second world war. I mean, those are some pretty scary words that you're using. There's no, I didn't I didn't say second world. I said we're, we're in a Cold War. OK, yeah. Cold Wars. Cold wars are dangerous places. You could go from a cold to a hot war if there is a, you know, a spark uh, or you know some type of a, a military event that that uh, uh, doesn't have any uh, guardrails or fail safes to limit escalation. I won't rule that out either. Yeah. Well, OK, so let me ask you about what's happening on the Ukraine border then, because you said that we're too focused on Russia. But don't you think China is looking at very closely at how the U.S. responds to Russia and, and does that you know, how they would respond if, let's say, China 
maybe maybe cross into Taiwan. Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, China is looking at the United States very carefully and has been for a long time and how it manages uh, its its own set of geostrategic uh, pressures. And, um, you know, this this goes way back. Um, uh, and, you know, whether it was the the red line in Syria that um, uh, was breached that we did nothing about. Uh, right. or, you know, other uh, uh, areas of um, that required us to be very forceful globally to the, um, you know, the disastrous um, departure from Afghanistan. Uh, the Chinese view, rightly or wrongly, um, is that we are a, a great power on the decline. Uh, and... <laughs> This is, in, in, in that view, this is their opportunity to seize. They do not necessarily feel that uh, they want to seize it immediately. But, it, you know, if, if the circumstances would allow that, um, you, you better believe they will step into to the lurch and take advantage of the situation. So, I, I you know, they're certainly watching what's going on. Uh, in the Ukraine, as as um, in Ukraine, as, as all of us are. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we you know, I listened to the news uh, tonight. Uh, sorry, not Fox News, but that's um, OK. <laughs> but, uh, We're not partisan. But, um, you know, we, we, we've heard different things all day long. You know, they're pulling right. back. They're not pulling back. They're building a new bridge. You know, they're bringing new troops in. They're taking old troops back. Um, you know, Putin's playing games with with all of us, and uh, how we respond to that, I, th- I think, is certainly uh, ample food for thought for China's own uh, assessment of our uh, geostrategic uh, commitments and capacities. Mm-hmm. So, Stephen, I'm gonna. I have 15 minutes to talk to you, but then we have 15 to 20 minutes with audience questions, and they're already coming through. So, in case people that are watching this they don't know, you can submit your questions to the committee and we'll fire it away at Stephen in just a bit. But let me ask you this about Taiwan. Do you think, how badly do you think President Xi wants to reunite across the Taiwan Straits? What will he do to get there? Look, I don't, you know, I I don't think that, you know, that he is changed the the calculus of, uh, of, of patience. You know, uh, I think, uh, Taiwan has always been the long-term objective of a unified uh, China. But, you know, 50 years ago, uh, the agreement was made that um, while the United States recognized the uh, the fact that um, uh, Taiwan was uh, eventually going to be uh, reunited mm-hmm. with the mainland, there was no, no time frame sent, uh, set for the exact uh, date of reunification. And, you know, I think the Chinese leadership has been uh, uh, patient uh, in, in waiting this out. Uh, mm-hmm. There are a lot of people that feel that, that Xi Jinping is a, is a very uh, impatient uh, man. And, you know, I'm sympathetic with that. I think he appears to be certainly uh, very different than uh, Deng Xiaoping. I mean, Deng Xiaoping was all about, you know, keeping a low profile, um, hiding your strength and biding your time, you know, by the sort of the Chinese um, uh, mantras that that he uh, ascribed to. And with uh, Xi Jinping, um, you know, he has been... um, uh, far from uh, bashful about um, exercising a much more muscular approach uh, to foreign policy, uh, not just the Belt and Road, but his military uh, adventures in the South China Sea and before that, uh, the, the East China Sea, and um, gets completely um, uh, exercised uh, when anyone uh dares to destabilize any aspect of um 
sort of the, the status quo with, with Taiwan. Uh, I think we learned a lesson, though, from uh, the unfortunate developments in Hong Kong yeah. over the past few years, and that is that um, uh, Xi Jinping will act uh, if he believes that his hand is forced mm-hmm. by an outbreak of um, anti-China uh, unrest. Uh, the democracy demonstrations uh, in China, uh, however well intended, uh, crossed the line for him. Uh, and so, you know, well, you know, the PLA troops never went in. Um, you know, the, the National People's Congress passed this new uh, national security law that was imposed on Hong Kong and they have a government and a police force uh, that is uh, acting uh, to execute, uh, implement it uh, from Xi Jinping's perspective. So should there be a similar uh, outbreak of unrest in Taiwan, you better believe that uh, they're not going to sit by, Uh, but um, you know, I, I don't see anything uh, uh, imminent on the horizon that would cause me to sound the alarm that, you know, here they go. Well, what about, I don't know if it surprised you because it definitely surprised me, the fact that Xi Jinping has gone after the country's billionaires. You saw what happened, Jack Ma, all the tech billionaires. You know, I thought this was a country that was communist but had capitalistic aspects. I, I well, believe society is probably more capitalist actually in China than here in the U.S. Yeah, look, I, I've been, um, as you said in your 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 kind um, introduction, <laughs> I, I've been very optimistic on China uh, in now the nearly twenty five years I've focused on China from you know the Wall Street perch and from my. Um, teaching at Yale over the last uh, 12 years. And I have to say that, you know, in, in the last um, uh, you know, six months, uh, there have been a series of, of new policies that <clears throat> the Xi Jinping leadership uh, has implemented that really do have me much more concerned about the medium to longer term prospects for China than I ever have been. And it's not that he's going after uh, Jack Ma, but, but this, this whole campaign that he calls common prosperity uh, is a blatant effort at redistribute uh, redistribution of income uh, and wealth. Uh, you know, for a communist, presumably egalitarian society, th- that type of redistribution should not be, um, you know, all that surprising. But, you know, they, they've encouraged uh, the dynamic growth of their Internet platform companies uh, as a real source of innovation and animal spirits. And it's, you know, they, they develop powerful, uh, world-shaping uh, uh, innovative platforms that have really produced uh, extraordinary progress uh, for the nation. And now they're saying no to that, not just through common prosperity, but also by regulations um, uh, aimed at stopping, um, you know, music and, um, you know, uh, ride sharing and private yeah. tutoring. Um, Going after movie stars, <laughs> yeah, movie stars. You know, uh, Bob Bing disappeared for a while. Yeah, and business, and business drinking, God forbid, possibly even golf courses. <laughs> Hard to know, but yeah. you know, they've they've taken you know a lot of policy actions that are disturbing, and that has got me worried about you know the the dynamism of China uh, in the future. As I said, I don't. Feel sorry for Jack. He'll he'll presumably be fine, but um, it's quite conceivable that um, uh, you know this is a uh, an approach that really 
uh, has lasting implications. Yes, Dr. Roach, uh, we're going to work hard on getting Susan back. But in the meantime, let's go to some audience questions here. Um, let's see. Let's start with Peter Schwartz, who's on our advisory board. Uh, is there any scenario where the U.S. accepts that China will be number one short of war? Well, Peter, it's a, it's a fair point. I mean, you know, the, you know, a lot of us frame this race for number one in terms of GDP and China by, you know, by one measure already is larger than the U.S. in terms of the way the um, International Monetary Fund measures GDP. Um, but that's more of a statistical artifice than, than a um, something that you can um, see more visibly. I think most extrapolations say, you know, it's going to happen uh, probably, you know, in the next, within the next five years. Sorry, I lost. Sorry, there, Stephen. I, I lost. Um, I lost connection there. Re You're just back. Uh, recently, I'm back. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks, Susan. Just we're just we're going let, through some audience questions here. Let me just right. finish one question, Susan, and then we get back to you. Um, so, I mean, it's inevitable that you know a, a country with um, you know four times the population of ours ultimately will have a larger GDP than ours. And so China will, will be number one, and that is not cause for war. If China becomes number one through military dominance, and, you know, its uh, defense outlays are now second in the world of the U.S., still far behind us, but if they stay on the path that they're on, they'll be spending more than us militarily by the end of this decade as well. You know, if they use that military weight and their new uh, weapons that appear from all reports to be increasingly uh, leading edge and sophisticated, if they util utilize those uh, to um, uh, project uh, power throughout Asia or, you know, possibly uh, elsewhere in the world, then, you know, China's number one uh, becomes a real uh, uh, threat uh, that the U.S. Would, would not, I think, be willing to swallow. The final thing I'll say, Peter, in response to that is we're making a lot in this country about uh, China's violation of um, uh, human rights norms from our perspective. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not prepared to go into, you know, all the, the details of what's gone on on the human rights front, whether it's um, in Xinjiang uh, or, um, you know, Tibet or Hong Kong uh, or, you know, even the oppression of um, of um, of NGOs and other <clears throat> um, more liberal forces uh, inside of China, we're not about to go to war over that. Though, I mean, we, we you know we we had a diplomatic boycott of the Olympics, which is you know a de minimis uh, protest at, at best, and I think you know we'll continue to um, uh, preach the. Western liberal gospel and and uh, uh, and raise issues like this, but but that's not a a concern I think that would uh, lead to um, more severe conflict. Susan, back to you. I just wanted to ask about the Olympics and pick up on that because there's been so much debate about who actually has it right. You know, Eileen Gu is representing China, and then Nathan Chen and all of the. Asian American superstars, they've been called traitors, participating in Beijing, but under the American flag. So in the future, I'm just curious as to what Stephen thinks is probably the right strategy for these athletes and how to get pulled into the politics of it. Well, and you know, Nathan Chen's a sophomore at Yale, so I'll have to ask him when he comes back to <laughs> campus. But, but yes. From what I is he guess, a student? What? Yeah, he, he's is not he? a student of mine, no. Oh. Uh, but, um, 
um, look, you know, he's, uh, from what I gather, intensely uh, apolitical and is ne- never given any uh, consideration to, uh, you know, these types of um, uh, sort of uh, cross-cultural political considerations uh, that you allude to. Um, Eileen Gouda, I mean, you know, she's, she, she's clearly different, born and raised in, in uh, I guess, um, San, Francisco. Uh, San Francisco, where most of you guys are <laughs> dialing in from. And, um, uh, you know, she's gone over to the other side and is a, a hero in, in China. I, I wonder um, how much of a hero she had been if she hadn't nailed that jump. Um, <laughs> but uh, in any case, she's, you know, a celebrity and and um, uh, has has caused a great celebration inside of China. But the, you know these cultural cross cultural issues um, are you know they're very important in in sort of shaping the social uh, discourse uh, in China and in influencing younger um, generations and their impressions on the acceptance of. Um, uh, you know, the Chinese identity uh, elsewhere in the world, especially in the United States. But I go back to the point I made on censorship. Um, it's not clear that the Chinese public, um, you know, gets any um, accurate yeah. read on uh, how uh, this issue plays uh, in the in in the United States or even how it plays out in reality in their own society. Well, we're going to get to audience questions, and we'll start with um, Chair Gary Rischel, who who thanks you again, Stephen, for sharing your time with the uh, San Francisco chapter of the Asia Society. And he says, if you were to compare the changes the U.S. needs to make to restore a healthy relationship with China against what China must do, how would you express a relative weighting of the required effort between the two countries? So is it better for the U.S. to look at the rest of the world and lifting all those boats instead of efforts to constrain China's influence? Yeah, that's a terrific question, Gary. Um, (laughs) I think um, that, you know, the 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 U.S., uh, I think, actually has more heavy lifting to do than the Chinese have to do to, to get this relationship right. Uh, you may not like the answer to that question, but uh, the way I view China is, you know, for the last 15 years, they have changed their approach to economic uh, growth and prosperity. They've decided that they didn't want to fit into the box that they had been on uh, in the early stages of its rela- of the relationship with the U.S. They decided that the days of just being, you know, a factory or an assembly line. Uh, or a producer didn't give them the middle class consumer that they needed for long term prosperity. So they're changing that. And, you know, there also there's a technology piece of that. And that's very contentious. I write about it a lot in the book. And, you know, the, the U.S. view is they're stealing our technology. Uh, and I think um, uh, I won't use the bullshit word again, but but I think I think <laughs> might as well. I, I, I think that there's um, much less validity to that than uh, appears in these reports that are issued by the U.S. Trade Representative's uh, office in filing uh, these, these trade disputes. China's changed the model. Uh, we're convinced that we don't have to change anything. Uh, and so we, we are the partner in this relationship that uh, insists that we've got all the answers and then we can stay the course and that China has to come to us. And um, China's saying, we're going our own way uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, we'll see you. And if that doesn't work out, then, you know, we've got no one to blame except ourselves. We don't have to, to play it the way the Chinese do, but we certainly have to make some major changes uh, in our own economy. And I would say in managing our own uh, political discourse as well, uh, if we're going to meet challenges 
like we are presented with uh, in China. And of course, uh, you know, in, in other uh, adversarial uh, relationships that we uh, may encounter yeah. along the way. So, Stephen, we have an anonymous attendee asking about the two sessions in March. And um, what topics would you follow closely there in terms of, I guess, getting hints as to what China's future strategy is? Well, you know, um, I, I think, you know, by the time we get to the, um, the National People's Congress uh, in, in March, um, there won't be much suspense over uh, the, the economic agenda, uh, mm -hmm. which all, always gets um, major attention through the premier's sort of annual work report, which is, this, you know, voluminous document um, assessing the, the past, current, and future state of the Chinese economy and the growth rate assumptions they're making and the policy actions that they are taking. The main event for the main political event for China will come later this year, presumably in November, uh, with the, um, uh, the party Congress uh, yeah. and the, the presumed um, uh, reappointment of Xi Jinping for another uh, a term in his leadership position. Between now and then, and this would include the two sessions, um, you know, barring an unexpected <laughs> Uh, development. There's very little that China, uh, I think, would be willing to take on to uh, rock the boat prior to this very important party Congress meeting. Yeah. So Don writes in, he wants to, he, well, it's a statement and then a question that the U.S. is blaming China for not attending the purchasing commitments in the phase one trade deal. Now, you mentioned that bilateral, the bilateral approach to the trade deficit would not work. Do you believe this kind of agreement is doomed to fail? And what would be the effective ways to deal with the U.S.-China economic relationship? Well, it's not that it's doomed to fail. It's that it failed. It didn't work. I mean, um, number one, the, the target... Well, then why did the Biden administration keep the tariffs in place if it's not well, working? Well, that's a fair point. I, I'm very critical of them for staying with a... <clears throat> a model that was doomed to failure uh, that was um, uh, implemented by, you know, the, the Trump administration and uh, broadcast as the greatest trade deal of, of the century. When you have uh, trade deficits, as I said last year, with 106 countries um, that reflect your lack of domestic saving not the alleged unfair trading practices of one trading partner. You can't fix your deficit problem by going after your largest uh, deficit trading partner. It didn't work with Japan. It's not working with uh, China. And, and so, you know, there are better ways to address trade and they have to do with really <laughs> making big adjustments in the structure of our own economy and the trade deficit will fall out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're unwilling uh, or unable to do that. And we fixate on China because it's an excuse for not getting our own house in order in terms of managing uh, our budget deficits over the long term and in boosting our national saving uh, and making us less reliant on surplus savings from abroad and running massive current account and multilateral trade deficits to attract the capital. So we have created this problem. It's yeah. not China's fault. You know, if, if we have problems with the way China conducts itself, um, according to the rules of global trade, we have every right to file disputes uh, with the, the, you know, the World Trade Organization or with other bodies, but to take unilateral actions, as uh, President Trump did uh, with China, uh, under the guise of, quote, making America great again, uh, was, you know, a non-starter uh, from the beginning. And, you know, the, the verdict is in on phase one. It was an mm -hmm. outright unmitigated failure. Okay. Well, you answer Amy Chen's question, who asked, how do we improve the U.S. savings problem? 
So that's one. And then Vernon wants to know if would it be better to maybe include China and Russia in the G7? The G7? Well, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I'm not so sure that that's the answer, although I'm not so sure, you know, that the G7 is nearly as effective as it used to be. I think the more operative uh, group of uh, major uh, powers is now the G20, of which China uh, is, a, is a member. And, um, you know, I, I certainly think it makes sense to have all <laughs> major powers at the table, including Russia, including China, uh, in dealing with, um, you know, important global economic and geostrategic uh, uh, issues. Uh, but, um, you know, the, we've had mixed success mm -hmm. uh, in using bodies like this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. They tend to have uh, more episodic impact during moments of crisis. So Ariel wants to ask for the solutions that you propose, what are the odds that U.S. the U.S. and China, Chinese governments actually implement them? And what's the timeline? Well, the timeline is sooner rather than later. Yeah. And, <laughs> yes. And the odds are low right now, which is why I wrote the, the damn book. I mean, um, we are... I think, wedded to a Byzantine outmoded framework of uh, addressing adversarial economic relationships. And again, and I, I emphasize this a lot in the book, um, we do this repeatedly. We did it with Japan, mm -hmm. and it didn't work. You know, we had a bad trade deficit problem in the early 80s. We were convinced that Japan was the source of it. And if you look at the Japanese share of our trade deficit in the 1980s, um, it was comparable, if not larger, than the share that uh, went to China uh, recently. But we beat the Japanese up. Uh, we forced them in the Plaza Accord, and they agreed to this, to revalue their currency, the yen, they um, responded to this by uh, cutting interest rates. They created these massive bubbles, and they're still digging out from what are now three lost decades of um, uh, being forced uh, to respond to America's bilateral fixation on its right. trade deficit. Uh, the Chinese are not going to do that, but we're trying to get them to, uh, again, take the, the hit uh, for our trade issues because we are unable or unwilling to address them ourselves. We always mm -hmm. like, you know, a scapegoat. We're the victims. You know, we have a victim complex. I'll go back to my, you know, uh, uh, you know, amateur psych psychological uh, perspective. You know, we need someone to blame for our problems. Now, Hakan wants to ask, would you be willing to preside over a U.S.-China 24th institution that would improve cooperation between the two countries? Would I personally be willing to do it? Yeah. <laughs> do you have the time when you're not writing books every year? Well, I have to look at my calendar. <laughs> so not October then when that book might come out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think China is investable right now? Because a lot of people that I talk to on Wall Street, just the indications that they're getting from President Xi the zero COVID policy, a lot of people would say they wouldn't touch a Chinese company right now. Look, I, I hear that too. Um, yeah. And I've been around markets long enough to know, Susan, that you just don't want to paint, you know, a, 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 mar a large market, a large economy with uh, one brush. There have been dislocations within the market, especially uh, you know, the once high flying internet platform companies, whether they've, you know, been beaten uh, down so much that there is um, nothing but upside after a yeah. severe correction, you know, you can make that case. And, and, you know, uh, you know, maybe some smart guys are willing to step up and, and, and take a stab at that on, 
uh, you know, large companies with uh, franchise brand and uh, technology. Um, but, um, you know, I think, you know, the rest of the, uh, the market, you know, is subject to, to, to different uh, sets of uh, conditions. I've long been optimistic in terms of the structure of the economy on the emergence mm-hmm. of um, more of a consumer-led, services-led, healthcare-led Chinese system. And, um, you know, the, they've created a lot of companies and will continue to be doing that Um and I would add life sciences to that, where there's got to be um, uh, a lot of opportunity that is still there that has not been uh, damaged by any of these policy reversals that have been unfortunate over the past uh, six months. Yeah. So you brought up Japan. And, you know, back in the 80s, I was still a very young child. Um, but back in the 80s, wasn't Japan supposed to be the number one economy and overtake the U.S. That didn't happen. So I'm just wondering, do you think China is still going to overtake the U.S. economy one day? Yeah, I mean, um, the number one best-selling um, nonfiction book on Japan was written by uh, Ezra Vogel. Uh, <laughs> yeah. called Japan is number one. Uh, I think it was published, um, uh, I want to say, probably, I, don't know, I was going to say 1979, but it could have been 1989. Wow. Uh, whatever it was, it was written at a time when um, uh, the West was convinced that Japan was on the ascendancy. And there were books written in, um, about um uh, the Japanese miracle. Uh, the miracle, though, was really a house of cards. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, there, there was a lot of um, uh, sort of <clears throat> phony financial engineering cross holdings between uh, conglomerates or caretsus. Uh, and there was a captive Ministry of Finance that uh, kept pumping liquidity uh, into the system and the currency was an important uh, piece in the mechanism. And when the bubbles burst in the early 90s, the wheels came off. Uh, and um, Ezra Vogel's book kept selling, uh, yeah. believe, believe it or not. But uh, Japan uh, has been pretty much, um, you know, on its back ever since. The Chinese have studied the lessons of Japan very seriously uh, a very senior uh, policymaker warned of the Japanization of China uh, about um, six years ago on the front pages of the uh, Chinese uh, People's Daily. They are not um, Japanese, and I think they've got a totally different approach uh, with a, uh, an appreciation for managing their risks much more effectively than the Japanese. Oh, yes. They will. So, they, so yes, they will overtake the U.S. economy one day. Well, nominal GDP, yes. Mm, uh, okay. But, um, you know, that's, I think, just a matter, matter of simple arithmetic, given the scale of their population relative to ours. Okay. Well, Stephen, it's been such a pleasure, as always. Thank we you. need to do this in person because I, I, I just don't like the the virtual Zoom calls. I think we're done with this, and I'm hoping that I'll see you. I hope you're today. right. You know, I, I haven't. I still haven't gone back to New Haven in almost two years. I'm going to make my first um, physical appearance in a classroom in um, on March first. So I'm wow. I'm looking forward to that. I, the students are too. I'm going to hand it back to Margaret. And thank you so much for this treat. Thank you, Susan. Great to see you. And thank you both. Please come out to San Francisco. You can do it in person with us, too. You guys covered so much content in a very (laughs) short period of time. Thank you, Susan, for weaving in all those topics. I really like the idea of the bilateral architecture, Stephen. So we're going to come back to you about you presiding over it. Stephen's new book, (laughs) Accidental Conflict, a new take on U.S.-China tensions. That's going to be out in October. You just got a sneak peek. So please do pick it up.
For the audience, please join us at all of our future events that are on our website. We have programs coming up on CFIUS, semiconductors, and space. For those joining our VIP reception, click over to that second Zoom link now. Thank you again to our speakers and to our Northern California team, Rex Lui, James Gale, Angela Chung, Rahul Deveskar, Nina Udagawa, and all of our interns. If you want to become a member or contribute, reach out to anyone on the team. And from all of us at the Northern California Center, thank you for joining us.